The priest walked across Ravner Street, only now his distant thoughts that reoccur any time he was alone were not of his wife, but of cigarettes, sweet cigarettes. He couldn't wait to get home to brew a coffee and stand on his second story patio to finally complete his morning ritual. He turned on his Oldsmobile to find the down south gospel stylings of Shirley Caesar's Satan work on a terrier kingdom down, lightly playing over the radio. This song reminded him of his mother and how she would sit at the kitchen table eating molasses bread and drinking a glass of cold water every morning. It soothed him like a nurse must be soothed when, for one day out of the week, the cries and moans of a mental institution are silenced and only the click of her heels can be heard. He listened to the song on the way home and reminisced of an easier time in Dark Bay when he was merely his own son's age or younger. Francis pulled into his crushed stone driveway and past the church and onto his house. The fog had cleared somewhat and the large field behind his home was now visible. A wind had kicked up and the trees in it were being pulled and heaved like they were attached to ropes. He exited his Oldsmobile and walked up his front steps into the kitchen and collapsed at the table. What a strange morning he mused. He then stood up and began to make his coffee. <sighs> he said in an almost unneeded volume, this is going to hit the spot. The dark brew boiled. He added his personal preference of sugar and cream, grabbed his cigarettes from their hiding place in the bookshelf, then went upstairs and out onto his patio. This patio overlooked his church and he sometimes wondered how one man could be left in charge of such a large, old, and beautiful structure. The Dark Bay Church was a rather big building with two prominent steeples, both with gigantic brass bells in them. It stood about a hundred feet high and was painted white with a jet black trim. The Sunday School was a small built-on section in the back, painted the same colors. Each window was an elaborate stained glass masterpiece, with the main window being Jesus Christ leading his sheep. He lit a cigarette. The first inhale was, in his mind, a thing of pure beauty. He relished this more, it seemed, than any other morning cigarette. Then once again, his mind began to wander. Francis! Francis! Where did you go? The kids are here complaining that they are hungry. I'm over here, Beth. Come check this out, it's amazing. Beth walked through the thick bush, keeping a close eye on little Joseph and Gabrielle. She emerged in a 20 by 20 clearing with a drop off on the farthest side from her. What do you expect us to see on this nature walk anyway? She grumbled, beginning to get fed up with this whole situation. Just look. The mother and her children walked slowly to the edge, and what they saw took their breath away. On the opposite side of a beautifully forested valley was a large lake, with a big glistening waterfall dropping almost fifty feet into it. The walk was worth it, he said softly. His muse was interrupted by the sound of a vehicle pulling into his driveway. He walked to the edge of the patio to see Martha Barry's white Cadillac pulling up. He instantly wondered what she was doing here on a Friday morning. Martha worked as a Department of Fisheries secretary a few miles away, in the town of Russellville. They had a deep water port, unlike Dark Bay, and the fishing industry was booming. She parked her car and got out, noticing the priest on his patio, and beckoning to him, she called, Francis, I really need to talk to you. It's important. Francis finished his cigarette and walked into his house and down the stairs. She greeted him at the back and began to cry. Francis, I, I didn't know who else to turn to. It's my husband. 
George has been drinking heavily since he lost his job as the mayor. Continue, Martha, he said. Well, I just wanted to ask you if there was anything you could do to help him. Is there any way you could show him that what he's doing to himself is wrong? He swears, he gambles now, and sometimes he... She broke down into hysterical crying now. The priest felt the pain in her heart and knew whatever she was about to say was awful. He decided to flick the switch, from friend to priest. My child, my child, calm down, calm down. You know I will do my best to help you. What does he do? She wiped her tears and stuttered a sentence that enraged the priest. Of course he didn't show this. Sometimes he... He rapes me. She broke down again. The priest thought for a moment, mostly of how ungrateful a man must be to rape his consenting life partner. Then he said calmly, Martha, who you need to tell is the police. But I can't, Francis. I love him. That was the killer right there. Love. Oh, that awful, awful word. It could destroy a man or woman or make them the happiest person alive. Listen, my child. Come to church this Sunday and we will finish this conversation. Make sure that George attends. Talk to him about this in the meantime. Be honest with him. Just ask him to stop drinking. I've tried, Father, but he won't listen. If you don't want to tell the police, then you must keep trying, or he will continue. <sighs> okay, Francis. She hugged him and let herself out. Francis was mentally drained. So much strange had happened in such a short period of time that he wanted to just collapse. But still, he had to replace the bulbs in the church before his son returned from school. He packed a small lunch and grabbed the bag of bulbs from the counter, walked down his back steps and across the field toward the church. As he got within 30 feet of the structure, a cold shiver ran down his spine.